Vitamin B12 is often called the energy vitamin. It's in multivitamins, fortified foods, and you'll even see B12 shots being advertised at wellness clinics. But what does it really do in your body? And is it true that more B12 automatically means more energy? Here's what you need to know. Vitamin B12 is absolutely essential for life. Your body needs it to make red blood cells, to keep your nerves healthy, and to help repair and build DNA. Without it, things start to go wrong, sometimes in subtle ways at first, and sometimes in ways that can cause permanent damage. What many people don't realize is that B12 deficiency is more common than you think. It's especially an issue for older adults, people on certain medications, and anyone who follows a vegan or vegetarian diet without supplementation. In this episode, we'll break down what B12 really is, where it comes from, why deficiency happens, the early warning signs you should never ignore, and the best ways to treat and prevent it. And make sure to stay with me until the very end because I'll share one of the overlooked symptoms of B12 deficiency that can show up before the classic anemia, and it often surprises even doctors. So let's start with the basics. What exactly is vitamin B12? Well, medically speaking, vitamin B12, also called cobalamin, is a water-soluble vitamin that your body cannot make on its own. That means you have to get it from food or supplements. It's an essential vitamin. B12 plays three critical roles in your health. Red blood cell formation. Without enough B12, you can't make healthy red blood cells. This leads to anemia, where your blood can't carry enough oxygen. Then there's nerve function. B12 helps build and maintain the protective covering called myelin that surrounds your nerves. Without it, nerve signals slow down or misfire dramatically. Then there's DNA synthesis. Every single cell in your body relies on B12 to help copy and repair DNA, the genetic instructions for life. What makes B12 unique is that it's found naturally only in animal products, things like meat, fish, poultry, eggs, and dairy. That's why vegetarians, and especially vegans, are at high risk of deficiency if they don't use fortified foods or supplements. It's also one of the larger, more complex vitamins, which means your body needs a very specific system to absorb it properly. That involves stomach acid, a protein called intrinsic factor, and the small intestine. If any part of that chain breaks down, like in older adults with low stomach acid, like people with autoimmune conditions that destroy intrinsic factor, you can become deficient even if your diet has plenty of vitamin B12. Let me give you a plain English analogy. Think of B12 like the spark plugs in your car. They're small, but without them, the whole engine misfires. You can have plenty of gas in the tank. In other words, plenty of food and calories, but without B12, your body's engine just doesn't run right. So B12 may be tiny, but it's essential for keeping your blood, your nerves, and your entire body functioning smoothly. So where does vitamin B12 actually come from and how does your body absorb it? Let's begin with dietary sources. Vitamin B12 is found naturally only in animal-based foods, including meat. Examples are obviously beef, pork, lamb, poultry like chicken and turkey, fish and shellfish like salmon, tuna, clam, sardines, and eggs or dairy products products like milk, cheese, and yogurt. For people who don't eat animal products, B12 can also be found in fortified foods like breakfast cereals, nutritional yeast, and plant-based milks that have had B12 added to them. Now let's look at the daily needs. The recommended daily amount for most adults is only about 2.4 micrograms. That's a tiny amount. But even though the requirement is small, not getting it consistently can lead to big problems over time. Now with regard to absorption, here's where B12 is different from most vitamins. Absorbing is a multi-step process. First, stomach acid frees B12 from food. Then it binds to a protein made by the stomach lining, which is called intrinsic factor. That complex travels to the small intestine where it's finally absorbed into the bloodstream. If any step in that process fails, not enough stomach acid, damage to the stomach lining, or disease in the small intestine, B12 absorption drops sharply. With age, older adults naturally produce less stomach acid, which makes it harder for them to release B12 from food. Some medical conditions like atrophic gastritis or celiac disease also interfere with absorption. The long-term use of certain medications like acid 
acid blockers, PPIs, H2 blockers, or metformin for diabetes also reduce B12 absorption. Here's another plain English analogy. Imagine B12 is like a VIP guest at a concert. To get in, they need a special ticket. In this case, it's intrinsic factor. And someone to guide them to their seat, the small intestine. If they lose the ticket, or if the guide isn't there, they never make it into the show, even if the concert is right next door. So while B12 is abundant in food for most people, the real challenge is absorbing it properly. And that's why deficiency becomes more common with age and certain health conditions. Now that we know where B12 comes from and how it's absorbed, let's talk about why deficiency happens. There are several main causes, some related to diet, others to absorption problems, and some to medical conditions. Since B12 is found only in animal products, vegans are at the highest risk if they don't take supplements or eat fortified foods. Vegetarians who eat eggs or dairy may get some B12, but even then it's often not enough. Over time, this can lead to depletion. Because the body stores B12 in the liver, deficiency may actually take years to show up. Pernicious anemia is an autoimmune condition where the body destroys the stomach cells that make intrinsic factor. Without intrinsic factor, even if you eat plenty of B12, you simply can't absorb it. Pernicious anemia normally shows up later in life and can cause severe neurological problems if untreated. Conditions like Crohn's disease, celiac disease, or chronic gastritis can damage the small intestine where B12 is absorbed. Weight loss surgery, like gastric bypass or surgical removal of parts of the stomach or the ileum, can also permanently reduce absorption of vitamin B12. Certain medications can also have an impact. The long-term use of proton pump inhibitors, or PPIs, or H2 blockers lowers stomach acid. This makes it harder for B12 to be released from food. Metformin is a common diabetes medication, and it's also been linked to lowering B12 levels with chronic use. As we age, stomach acid naturally declines. This means even people who eat meat and dairy can still become deficient, simply because their bodies can't break it down and absorb it efficiently. Think of B12 like water coming through a series of pipes. If the supply is cut off at the source, like a vegan diet, nothing comes in. If the pipes are blocked, think of Crohn's disease or surgery, it can't flow. And if the faucet is broken, no intrinsic factor is produced. So you can't get any water even though the tank is full. Key takeaway way here is that deficiency can come from not getting enough B12 in your diet, but far more often it's because your body has trouble absorbing it properly. And that's why it's so common in older adults and people with certain health conditions. Vitamin B12 deficiency can affect the body in a wide variety of ways. Some are obvious and some are much more subtle. Let's go through the main symptoms and why they happen. Number one, fatigue and weakness. Without enough B12, your body just can't make healthy red blood cells. This leads to megaloblastic anemia, where the cells are are large and fragile, but they just can't carry oxygen efficiently. The result? Well, it's constant tiredness, weakness, and shortness of breath, and people also have pale skin. Second, we have neurological symptoms. This is one of the most dangerous parts of B12 deficiency. It can damage the nervous system. Numbness and tingling in the hands and feet called peripheral neuropathy is often a symptom. There can also be difficulty with balance or walking. Muscle weakness or clumsiness is also seen with B12 deficiency, as are memory problems, confusion, and even dementia-like symptoms in severe cases. Here's the key point. These neurological symptoms can develop even without anemia. That means someone can have normal-looking blood counts but still suffer from nerve damage if their B12 level is low. Psychological and cognitive changes like mood disturbances such as depression or ear can also occur. Difficulty concentrating or what we call brain fog can absolutely come to manifest itself with B12 deficiency. In older adults, deficiency has been linked to increased risk of cognitive decline for sure. Then we have oral and skin changes, a swollen inflamed tongue, what we call glossitis, that may feel sore or extra smooth. People can also get mouth ulcers. They can get pale or jaundice, slightly yellow looking. Their skin will change hue due to abnormal red blood cells breaking down. Severe or untreated cases of long-term deficiency can cause irreversible nerve damage. In children or infants, deficiency can stunt growth and development. 
In adults, it can mimic other neurological diseases if missed. Here's another plain English analogy for you. Think of B12 like the wiring in a house. Without it, the lights, or the energy, starts to flicker. The appliances, like the nerves and the muscles, misfire. And eventually, the whole electrical system becomes unreliable. You might first notice dim lights, call it fatigue. But if the wiring keeps fraying, you have this ongoing deficiency, you'll start to see major breakdowns in the system. Key takeaway, B12 deficiency doesn't just cause anemia and tiredness. It can cause neurological damage that may become permanent if not treated early. That's why awareness and early testing are so important. Now let's talk about diagnosis and testing. How do doctors actually diagnose vitamin B12 deficiency? Well, number one is blood tests. The first step is usually a simple serum B12 test. Normal ranges vary, but generally a level between 200 picograms per milliliter is considered deficient. Here's the catch. Some people with levels in the low normal range, 200 to 300 PG per ml, can still have symptoms. Then there are functional tests. That's why doctors often use additional tests to confirm vitamin B12 deficiency. Methylmalonic acid, MMA. This rises when B12 is low, making it a very sensitive marker. Homocysteine is also a very important test. This is also elevated in B12 deficiency, though it can be higher for other reasons too. These tests help catch cases where the standard B12 level looks okay, but the body's actually running low. Then there's a CBC or a complete blood count. This is a very, very common blood test that we've basically all had. A CBC can show signs of megaloblastic anemia, those large immature red blood cells that have trouble carrying oxygen. But remember, anemia doesn't always appear first. Neurological symptoms may show up before blood changes, which is why relying on anemia to make the diagnosis can miss many cases. Now let's talk about identifying the cause once deficiency is confirmed. The next step is always figuring out why. Is it dietary, like veganism without supplementation? Is it absorption, like pernicious anemia or gastric surgery? Or is it medication related, like long-term use of PPIs or metformin? Could also be a combination of any of these. Here's an analogy. Checking B12 is like checking the fuel gauge in your car. The gauge shows you, let's say, the serum level. It might show that you have some gas, but if the engine's sputtering, symptoms, and high MMA, it's clear that the tank isn't delivering enough fuel where it needs to go. The key takeaway, diagnosis isn't just about one blood test. It's about looking at the full picture, lab results, symptoms, and the underlying causes. Now let's talk a little bit about treatment and supplementation. The good news about vitamin B12 deficiency is that treatment is usually very effective and safe. Let's go through the main options now. Number one is oral supplements. For most people, oral B12 tablets are the first line of treatment. Common forms include cyanocobalamin, this is the most widely studied and used, and methylcobalamin, a natural form, though not proven to be superior. High dose vitamin B12, usually 1,000 micrograms per day, is enough to correct deficiency in many patients, even some with absorption issues. B12 is water soluble, so your body excretes what it doesn't use. That's why supplementation is considered very safe. Then we have sublingual supplements. These dissolve under the tongue. Some people believe they absorb better, but research shows they're about as effective as oral tablets when taken in high doses. Then we have injections, intramuscular B12, necessary for people with severe deficiency or absorption problems like pernicious anemia, gastric bypass surgery, or significant gastrointestinal disease. Typically given as cyanocobalamin injections, often starting with daily or weekly doses until levels normalize, then every one to three months for maintenance. These are very effective at rapidly restoring B12 levels and relieving symptoms. Now we have dietary fortification for prevention. Vegetarians and vegans can rely on fortified foods like plant-based milks, breakfast cereals, or nutritional yeast. But if they don't consume these consistently, supplements are essential. The recommended daily intake for adults is only about 2.4 micrograms. Supplements are usually much higher, 500 to 1,000 micrograms, but that's because absorption from supplements is only a small fraction. There's no known danger of taking too much vitamin B12 in healthy individuals since excess is excreted in the urine. The main caution is that in people with kidney disease or certain rare conditions, very high doses should be monitored by a doctor. Think of B12 like refilling a water tank. If the pipes are intact, drinking water, oral supplements, is enough to refill the tank. But if the pipes are broken, like in pernicious anemia, you have to pump water directly into the tank, meaning injections. Either way, once you get enough into the system, the system runs. Either way, once you get enough into the system, the system runs smoothly again. Here's a key takeaway. Most deficiencies can be corrected with simple oral supplements, but people with absorption issues often 
often need injections for life. Either way, treatment is safe and effective and can prevent serious, even permanent complications. Now let's talk about a few of the myths and facts with regard to vitamin B12. With all the hype around vitamin B12, there are plenty of misconceptions. Let's clear up a few of those most common ones right now. Myth number one, B12 gives everybody a big energy boost. The fact is, if you're deficient, restoring B12 can absolutely improve your fatigue and energy levels, but if your levels are normal, taking extra won't make you feel like a superstar. It's not going to give you that supercharged feeling that some people try to promote. It's not like caffeine. It's simply replacing what your body is already missing. Myth number two, B12 shots are always better than pills. The fact is injections are necessary for people with absorption problems like pernicious anemia or gastric surgery, but for many others, high dose oral supplements work just as well. Pills are usually easier, cheaper, and just as effective for most people. Now we come to myth number three, only vegans get B12 deficiency. The fact is vegans are at high risk if they don't supplement, but they're not the only ones. Older adults, people on acid blockers or metformin, and those with GI conditions are all at risk even if they eat meat and dairy. Myth number four, you can't overdose on B12, so more is always better. The fact is, while B12 is very safe and excess is excreted in the urine, there's no added benefit to megadose if your body doesn't need it. More isn't always better, balance is the key. Also remember, with renal insufficiency, it can be dangerous. Key takeaway is that B12 is essential, but it's not magical. It restores what your body lacks, but it doesn't act like a stimulant. And the best form of supplementation depends on your personal health situation. So let's wrap it up. Vitamin B12 is small, but it's mighty. It plays a critical role in keeping your blood healthy, your nerves functioning, and your brain sharp. We've covered what B12 is. It's a water-soluble vitamin, essential for red blood cells, nerve health, and DNA synthesis. We've covered where it comes from, mostly animal-based foods with fortified options for vegetarians and vegans. We've also talked about why deficiency happens, from vegan diets without supplementation to absorption problems like pernicious anemia, GI disorders, or certain medications. We've also talked about the symptoms, fatigue, weakness, anemia, but also the overlooked neurological changes like numbness, tingling, balance issues, and memory problems that can appear before anemia. The diagnosis is found through blood tests, methylmalonic acid, homocysteine, and the importance of looking beyond borderline normal numbers. Treatment starts with oral supplementation and includes injections for those with absorption problems. Treatment can also involve fortified foods for prevention, especially in vegetarians and vegans. The myths. No, B12 isn't a miracle energy booster, and no, shots aren't automatically better than pills. Here's the most important takeaway. B12 is common, treatable, and preventable. The danger isn't that it's rare, it's that it often goes unnoticed until the damage is already done. That's why early testing and treatment really do matter. So if you're at risk, whether you're a vegan, on long-term acid-reducing medications, over the age of 60 or living with a GI condition, please talk to your doctor about checking your B12 levels. Protecting your B12 isn't just about avoiding anemia. It's about protecting your brain, your nerves, and your future health. Hey, if you found this video helpful, please share it with somebody who might be at risk for deficiency, and I'd love to hear from you in the comments. Have you ever had your B12 levels checked or noticed that symptoms improve after supplementation? I'd love to hear your story. Don't forget to subscribe for more evidence-based guidance on nutrition, supplements, and cardiovascular health. I'm Dr. John Chuback, and I'll see you in the next video.